field of psychotherapy, which is social workers, counselors, marriage family therapists, psychologists. These are people who do, do not have prescribing privileges. The people who have prescribing privileges are MDs. Now, most psychiatric medicine is not being prescribed by psychiatrists. Exactly. It's being prescribed by internal medicine docs. Our, our family, our family yeah, practice docs, uh, they just went right around the, the uh, psychiatrist in right. a sense. So if you go to your family practice doc and you say, my gosh, I just had a tremendous loss, well, that family practice doc may give you a prescription when really the best thing that you could do, uh, rather than having a biological intervention, is have somebody guide you about what are the steps for getting through loss as efficiently and meaningfully as possible. And so now, in more uh, evolved circles, there's this tendency for integration. How can we bring behavioral health care onto the front line of medical care? Because, for example, if people have ulcers, if people have migraine headaches, there are many psychosomatic components to these. When seamlessly integrated, when there's a seamless integration between behavioral health care and medical health care, we find that we do medical care offset. We decrease the cost of medical care by bringing behavioral health care onto the front line. So this is happening around the United States, many projects, and uh, it is the growing edge, the evolving edge of medical psychiatric care. Hey, well, that's very interesting because it, there were countercurrents uh, going uh, quite differently. Uh, in, uh, two, two, two examples would be uh, one of my professors at the University of Kentucky uh, psychiatric department was Connie Wilbur who was the analyst in, in Sybil. And the whole, whole analytic approach was extremely time consuming. As you know, people would go uh, you know, several times a week and uh, very expensive and very individual, non-inclusive of the, of the family system. Whereas uh, Milton Erickson and, and the family therapists not only uh, looked at the bigger picture, the, the whole being more than the sum of the parts, but also, uh, I think Erickson had a lot to do with what's known as brief therapy and, 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 and just the notion of uh, uh, rather than something taking years and tens of thousands of dollars to treat, uh, apparently, uh, his, 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 Milton Erickson's book, Uncommon Therapy, is, is like a, the Bible as to religion among therapists. Many of us are... are, are Never endingly inspired by the creativity, uh, uh, and 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 anyway, back back to that notion though of, of brief therapy. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? And yeah, a concern, uh, an easy way of saying that is that psychotherapy is a problem. The problem is that the person is in psychotherapy. The solution is to get the person out of therapy, living life independent of therapy as quickly as possible. And whereas in the a pristine analytic tradition, and which may be very good for certain kinds of problems. If a person has a deep-seated personality disorder, then it may be that a long-term therapy approach is necessary. That could be in a cognitive behavior therapy model, it could be in a psychoanalytic model, that the jury is out about what kind of approaches are really most effective in working with deep-seated personality problems. But for most of the problems that people bring, phobias, depression, anxiety, relationship problems, habit problems, a brief therapy approach is, is indicated. And again, we have technology now. In the olden days with Freud, we didn't have a very sophisticated technology. Psychotherapy is still in its adolescence. It's just uh, 125 years old, approximately. Right, right. And so we're still uh, learning and developing and researching. And now it's really part of the medical system. So there's, um, you know, if you have Medicare, if you have health insurance, behavioral health benefits are part of that because people recognize that you can actually decrease medical expenses by uh, making psychotherapy part of the system of integration with uh, frontline medical care. And again, there was a, there was a, a countercurrent uh, quite different from that that, that has prevailed yes. over a number of years where where uh, people were simply given medication 
if, if it was a psychotherapy issue, if they weren't acutely suicidal or, or some extreme situation, if they weren't hospitalized or given shock treatment, insurance companies were slow to, to pay, so there's a tendency to over diagnose, if you will, with the built into that system, as opposed to what you're describing, a health-oriented system where people are rewarded for being healthy. What's the metaphor about either you can give people fish or you can teach them how to fish? Right. And so if you give people um, psychiatric medication, it, uh, immediately you have a cost-benefit because it's cheaper than putting people on psychotherapy. Right. But then, um, if, unless you're planning on staying medication for, for the rest of your life, because it, if you do cognitive behavior therapy, for example, for depression, for anxiety, rather than giving people medication, well, the process may be a little longer in the initial phase, but the benefits are much more enduring over the long run because people learn how to fish. They learn how to control their uh, anxieties. They learn how to change their mood. They learn that there are techniques available for being able to be in a relationship and be happier. So brief therapy evolved as the technology evolved. When Freud was doing psychoanalysis, he was interested in studying the contents of the unconscious and how those past influences had an effect on the present, and that could be a very time-consuming process. But past is prologue, and it's not necessarily true that understanding the roots leads you to change. So in psychotherapy, there have been, oh, I'd say five, maybe six major streams of thought that have influenced psychotherapy. The first 60 years was dominated by psychoanalysis, and then around the time of World War II, you had behavior therapy, which was a much more technical procedure about conditioning and using conditioning and deconditioning approaches. You had the Skinner, Skinner mm -hmm. Wolpe. Yeah. Yeah. Then you had the advent of humanistic psychology, which is called Rogers, uh, which Perez. Carl Rogers, yeah. University of Wisconsin. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, you had uh, another school you had in the 1960s, the development of systems approaches, thinking about family approaches. And it's, you know, it's my philosophy that the family is the best context for change, and the family is the best person to change the members of the family. But if you bring the family together with an experienced therapist, a trained listener with a technology, that therapist becomes not their a guide, but a catalyst. And sometimes in order for change to happen, you need a catalyst that makes the reaction go a little bit quicker. It moves the chemical reaction a little bit quicker. Right. I would say that Erickson represented a uniquely different school in distinction to the psychoanalytic approach, the behavioral approach, the humanistic approach, the systems approach, that Erickson was um, truly remarkable. There's probably a hundred books out now that are directly about Erickson. Right. And in anybody's pantheon of who the greatest therapists were in history, Erickson would be certainly in the top ten. What mm -hmm. Freud contributed to the theory of psychotherapy, many people say Erickson contributed to the technology of psychotherapy. It was a very practical approach that was based on stimulating resources. So that rather than pe thinking of people as uh, having these uh, uh, crippling impulses in their unconscious, Erickson looked at the unconscious as being benign and a storehouse, a repository of resources. But many times people are out of contact with the resources that they have. So for example, a patient comes to see me and the patient says, Dr. Zayek, you've got to help me. I say, what's the problem? The patient says, terrible anxiety. I say, tell me about it. The patient says, well, yeah, every time I get into an airplane, I have paralyzing anxiety. I tremble, I sweat, I choke, I think I'm going to go crazy, I can't get in an airplane. I say, no. well, tell me, what's your problem? Uh, what's your profession? The person says, well, I'm a public speaker. That's my problem. I've got to travel, I can't get in an airplane. Well, this person in one context has incredible resources, but in another context, they act like they're resourceless. Well, the next patient comes to see me. These are hypothetical patients. Good, yeah. The next patient says, you know, Dr. Zai, I can't get up in front of a group of people. Every time I try to get up in front of a group of people, I have paralyzing anxiety. I start to sweat. I start to tremble. I start to choke. I'm afraid of going crazy. I can't get up in front of a group of people. I say, please tell me, what's your occupation? The person says, well, that's the problem. I'm a test pilot. 
I fly planes two times the speed of sound. I fly them vertical. I fly them inverted. I have to tell them about my findings. I can't get up in front of a group of people. Now, in that one context, this person has tremendous resources. But in another context, the person believes that they're resourceless.